Father's Day is sort of special to me because I thank the Lord every day that I had a father that was a Christian father. And he believed every bit of the Bible. There wasn't no compromise. But he was a little bit of a stubborn individual. Don't say nothing, Judy. <laughs> and he got sick and he had pain. He wouldn't go to the doctor for almost two years. And when he finally went, he had cancer. They did surgery and the most generous doctor gave him six months to live. And he'd tell everybody those six months were the best eight years he had ever had because God wasn't done with him yet. But I never will forget the day he went on to heaven. Me and my brother were standing there in the hospital room. And he had been in pain and you could see the pain in his face. And just all of a sudden, he starts smiling. The pain leaves and he turns around and looks at me and my brother and he says, boys, I'm floating in the air. And then he just had the happiest look on his face. We didn't know what he had saw at that time, but we understood it. And it wasn't long after that I run across this song and it reminds me so much of the day my father went to heaven. Of a dying dear old friend We talked about what Jesus said How someday we'll live again He held his Bible to his chest As he slowly slipped away But before he took that final breath I heard my daddy say is I can hear the angels singing Oh, it's true Heaven's bells are ringing I can see the face of my Jesus And he's coming for me It's true I can hear the family singing Oh, it's true The heavens bells are ringing I can see the face of my Jesus Oh, it's true I know that there will come a day When death will come for me and they will put my body in the ground But that's not where I'll be So when I get those fears and doubts About what lies ahead I just think about my dear old dad And the last two words he said can hear the angels singing It's true Heaven bells I hear them ring I can see the face of my father and he's coming for me Oh It's true I see my loved ones they are waving at it is true The things of earth are fading I can see the face of my son Oh, it's true You know, Dad, I miss you But I just know one of these days We're going to be singing together one more time Oh, it's true
raining. <laughs> if you came and it's raining, you are serious about church. I'm telling you that. Oh, good to see the scalps on the back row. Woo! My neighbors are here. I got to behave now because they know what I'm really like. All right. Let's stand up. We're going to have prayer. And after the prayer, you can remain standing. Terry is going to lead us in some music. And everyone standing this morning, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here today. And uh, my father's here, Buddy Mullinax. So we're going to get him to lead us in prayer. Dad, if you'll lead us in prayer. Father, we're glad to be in the house of God this morning. Hmm. We're here to listen from the book of God. Yes. We're glad that we know that it's true. Mm. It's been tested. Yes. And thank you that you are in the truth. Mm. I pray you feed the hungry people today. Yes. Lord of God. Mm. Bless the pastor today. Don't mm. with the blessed Holy Spirit. Yes, God, do Lord. All the stuff. Listen. Mm. And he what God has to say to us. Yes. Bless the service all around the world today where people mm. meet in to meet God. Yes. Pour out your spirit upon us mm. and use us in your service. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please remain standing. Let's sing some. Oh, him honoring our fathers here. Honoring our fathers. Everyone join in as we sing. so much if you listen to the words it's titled God give us Christian homes but ain't you happy that God gave us Christian fathers everyone singing
also give us the faith of our fathers. Everyone join me, this old hymn. Everyone join in. Here's where we would remain standing, but after Terry sang that solo, I was supposed to make the announcements. So we'll stand some other day. All right. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, after the announcements, we will take time for the offering, and you who feel comfortable and desire to can bring your offering up to the communion table while Margaret plays us something beautiful on the piano. And if you don't feel comfortable, we have baskets out front. And not going to be long, we'll start passing the offering plates again, and that'll be a great thing. So here's a card to West Hendersonville Baptist Church. And it says, oh, it's got a picture of Nate Tony, my grandson over here who graduated from high school this year. Let's give him a hand. He uh, graduated sooner come later. <laughs> and uh, no, I really, he's a, he's a smart guy. It only took him, what, 16 years to get out? But, uh, they just uh, finished the second round of the baseball tournament. They ran, ran into a buzz saw down in Cox Mill. A pretty good team, but Nate did really good. Hit a long home run in that first game. And uh, he's got a lot of good prospects ahead of him. And when he's in the major leagues someday, in his dreams. Okay, now, what was we talking about? Oh, yeah, no. He's a good ball player. All right, we're going to have prayer in a few minutes for, for the offering. We'll also be praying for Clint's dad, who's in the hospital. Uh, remember that if you'd like to go on the trip uh, in July to, uh, up to Farmer's Daughter, a nice bus trip up there, and there's just one fee. What is it, $25, Bobby? $25 covers the meal and the trip to Davy Crockett Home Place and all that stuff, the bus ride. Be sure to sign up on the table out front uh, here. Um, also remember that on Wednesday night we have Bible Essentials under construction. It's a Bible study that starts at 6, lasts about 30 minutes, and then we have uh, choir practice right after that. Um, also this morning right after the offering we'll have the Lord's Supper. Uh, is anybody that did not get one of these as you came in, uh, a little uh, Lord's Supper packet, raise your hand and we'll go ahead and get you one now. Anybody needs one? Uh, the ushers will bring you one right in. Okay, everybody got one? All right. Um, next Sunday, we'll be giving out our uh, Hope Beneath the Willow for the month of July. 
And I was telling you there are a lot more pictures in this, and I said 15 or 16, so before church I counted. There's 23 pictures in the back of our revival and other events we did last month. So be sure you're here next week to get this copy of this uh, book. We'd be glad for you to have one. Uh, this morning, we've already, I've already had somebody give me their pledge. You remember last Sunday? If you weren't here last Sunday, we don't want you to miss out. And we're raising $6,000 for our insurance premium that's coming up here in a week or so. Uh, because we didn't want to mess ourselves up. We finally got in the black back in January after a long period of swimming in the red through the pandemic. And we're trying to stay there. And our offerings have been up. You folks have been giving wonderfully. But we didn't want that $6,000 to get us, get us uh, without looking. And so we had several people pledge $500 and $250 and $100. And we came up, I think Norma said, $5,800 out of that $6,000. Uh, so if, uh, how much? Excuse me, 6,200, okay? Amen. And uh, so anything over 6,000 goes to the preacher and all God's people said, amen. <laughs> all right. Okay. And all God's people said, hey, amen. <laughs> I knew that sign would come in handy one day. So, um, all right, let's pray for the offering. And uh, again, you, while Margaret's playing, you can feel free to come up and, and place your offering on the communion table. Father, we thank you for your blessings. Lord, we even stop right now and thank you for the rain. God, we can remember just a few years ago, months and months and years of no rain and the drought and the dust and there wasn't much hope around here. And you have just seen fit to bless us with rain. God, we thank you for that today. Lord, bless the giver, gift and the giver this morning in the offerings. Use it for your honor and glory for our church and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I, I didn't see anything. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Reminded me that I didn't read off this card. Oh, come, this is for Nate. Come uh, Saturday, June 26, drop in from 2 to 3.30, 402 Reed Drive, East Flat Rock, RSVP Nikki. And here's a phone number, so we'll put this out on the table so you can see it. And uh, that'll be at their home, uh, 
Dustin and Tony, uh, Nikki, good to see you today. That's my son and daughter. I mean, my son-in-law and daughter. And uh, they, after a while, they just turn into your son. And then Michael, my other son-in-law, and Misty and their families here today. And I see some of you have your families visiting with you. So that being said, let's have all the fathers to stand and walk down front here. Right across the front, I want you to line up shoulder to shoulder. All the fathers, come on down here. Well, I tell you, y'all move a lot slower than the moms. <laughs> and we want to take a, at least one picture, but not a lot of pictures, because uh, we treasure our camera's health. But we'll take a picture or two of this group. It looks real good. Norma is going to give each one of you fathers a gift. Now, it's not as nice as the gift we'd give the moms, you know. We always spend that money on the moms, and whatever's left over, we get you something. And so this pen that you're getting is, uh, I think they said it's something under a thousand dollars. So you, way, Tom said way under. <laughs> oh, did anybody get us a good picture? Oh, oh Norma's going to take the picture. All right, Norma, take a picture. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. That's good. All right, let's get a picture. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, you may be seated. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> you know that was your two minutes in the sun, and you'll not get it until next year, same time. <laughs> Take advantage of it. All right, you have this uh, cup. If you barely take that little top part off there, you have the wafer. And I'll read some scripture here. For I have received of you of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread. Father, we ask the Lord to bless this bread. This little wafer, Lord, doesn't really exactly add up to the suffering your body took place on Calvary, but Lord, help us to acknowledge that this morning. Use it, Lord, in your name we pray. The Bible said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also, he took the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood you shed on Calvary. Lord, the blood that takes away our sins. Today, Lord, we commemorate the blood that you shed on Calvary. Lord, and just help us to always be mindful of your sacrifice. In your name we pray. Amen. He took the cup, and when he had supped, he said, This is cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, this morning, Norm and I are going to sing a song. And this song, by the way, we haven't sung probably since the 80s because just the other day, Norma said, Hey, you remember, didn't we sing this song? And I said, Oh, yeah, that's right, we did. And uh, so we found the words. And uh, we decided that today would be the day to sing it. We're trying it out on y'all. <clears throat> the title of it is Forgiven. <clears throat> Oh, how 
Day today, he got a little wagon to pull on his lawnmower, yes, and he told him he said that it was so nice because he got me the lawnmower for Mother's Day. So I got, which isn't true, <laughs> but you know I just thank God for this man and for his dad and for my dad who's already in heaven. And one thing I'll never forget, Papa, he told me with tears in his eyes after I lost my dad. He said, Norma, he said. Just know I'm here for you, and I, I consider you my family. And you know, without Papa, he's my daddy now here on earth, and I thank God for him. He has been an example to all the men in our family yeah. to stand firm in God and believe and have faith. Yeah. And you know, I thank God I'm forgiven because I have not lived a perfect life. You know, but that song, I'm forgiven. Amen. I have yes. the assurance. Yes. And I just thank God. And so, and to have my family sitting over there. Y'all have no idea what that does for this old lady's heart. But anyway, Jerry, happy Father's Day, and I love him, and I thank God for the daddy he is to our girls. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Norma. And that wasn't just a little wagon to pull behind my lawnmower. It was a hauler. It's called a hauler. <laughs> When you're a man, it's not a little wagon, it's a hauler. Yeah, that guy at the uh, Cub Cadet place said, well, this is nice for her getting you this for Father's Day. I said, well, I got her the lawnmower for Mother's Day. <laughs> it's been a happy relationship. <laughs> hey, in your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I know this message sounds a little bit disrespectful in the title of the old man in your house because we... You know, we use that reference when it's disrespectful to a, a dad calling him the old man, the old man in your house. But it's right in the Bible. I'm not just saying that gives you permission to say it, but right there it is in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 31 and 32. If that picture up there is best you can see it. That's uh, my family, my dad and mom, and then my older brother to the left, me, younger brother. Both my brothers are in heaven. And then on the right side over there, Karen, Miriam, and Susan, the three it's my three sisters. Uh, the old man in your house, beginning with verse 31 of 1 Samuel 2, in the Bible reads, Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall be not an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. Let's pray. Father, Sort of a crude title this morning, Lord, but with nothing's crude out of the Word of God, we ask that you take whatever words I have to say, use them for your benefit, Lord, and the benefit of the listening ears. Hide me behind the cross, and let's see Jesus this morning high and lifted up. God, just bless us in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The old man in your house. I heard the story of the father who had five children and a toy he had won at a raffle. He called the kids together to ask which one should have the present. He said, who has been the most obedient? Then he said to the children, who never talks back to your mother? Who does everything she says? In unison, all the five voices said, okay, daddy, you get the toy. <laughs> Did you know dads are not important in the house? They're urgent in the house. They're vital in the house. 
43% of U.S. children live without their father, according to the U.S. Department of Census. 63% of teen suicides are from fatherless homes. That's five times the national average. 90% of all runaways and homeless children are from fatherless homes. That's 32 times the national average. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes, four times the national average. 85% of children with behavioral problems come from fatherless homes. 71% of pregnant teenagers lack a father. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes, nine times the national average. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youths in prison come from fatherless homes, 20 times the national average. Daughters of single parents without a father involve 53% more likely to marry as many teenagers, 711% more likely to have children as teenagers, 164% more likely to have a premarital birth, and 92% more likely to get a divorce themselves. We've got, we could go on with these statistics. The father is vital in the home. Without a father in the house, girls are twice as likely to drop out of high school, twice as likely to end up in jail, four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. Children in homes where the father is involved are more confident, better able to deal with frustration, better able to gain independence and their own identity, more likely to mature into compassionate adults, more likely to have high self-esteem, be more sociable, more secure as infants, less likely to show signs of depression, and on and on we could go. If you're a dad and you're in the home with your wife and children, God bless you. I, this, you say, what's the, one of the keys to turning our nation around spiritually is to get fathers present in the home and have the father be vitally important to the nature of that home. I'm not just saying that. I'm giving you what the Bible tells us. And the Bible says, gives us an example. In this particular passage here, it has its roots in the book of Judges. In the chaotic time, when the Bible said there was no king in Israel, every man did that which, which was right in his own eyes. Have we ever lived in a more time that's comparable to that right there? Every man d does what's right in his own eyes. Samuel, the baby born to Hannah, will become a kingmaker, the one who will anoint Saul and he'll anoint David. Israel, under these kings and David's sons, Solomon will rise to prominence unmatched in history. Bible commentator Adam Clark says this, The calamity which Eli witnesses in the defeat of the Israelites and the capture of the ark, the death of his wicked sons, and the triumph of the Philistines, all this Eli sees, that is, knew to have taken place before he met with his own tragical death. In this passage, we see two contrasting views. One is young Samuel, whose mother has turned totally over to Eli, the priest, and to God. So she takes young Samuel and takes him down to Eli in the church and says, Eli, you raise him according to what God would have you to do. On the other hand, we have Eli's own two sons, Hopni and Phinehas are lawbreakers. They desecrate customs of the temple. They partake in sexual misconduct, uh, duct, and they disobey their own father, Eli. The Bible says them in, about them in 1 Samuel, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. In another place, Eli does all he can as a father to convince them of their wrongdoing. But the Bible says, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father before the Lord would slay them. Then the Bible says, and the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that should do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my anointed forever. So even in this passage, we have two different sets of boys. One boy, Samuel, the other two, Eli's sons. And they both go opposite directions without a father, a godly father to direct them. So dads, here's the question this morning. What must we enhance in our lives to assure that our kids will always respect us and our faith? 
We're going to find the answer to that right here in verse 31. We won't even vary from verse 31. When you have it before you, we'll stay right there. Here's the first thing we must enhance. The first thing is a father's influence. A father's influence. Look what it says. Behold, the days will come that I will cut off thine arm. This arm, a father's influence, is compared to an arm. How can that be compared to an arm? Because a dad must keep we must work to keep a connection or a bond between himself and his children. That reach, that arm, he must have a connection. Think about this. A father's arm has a muscle. A dad must be strong in discipline. That's right, he must be the one. You know, I don't know about you, but my mom would always say with us six kids, if she got down to where we just wasn't minding her or paying much attention, that's okay. Your dad will be here after a while. He'll take care of you. Hey, your dad will be here at the end of the day. He'll have something to say about this. And boy, there was something about what my mom said that was cemented or held together by the strength and the image of my dad. A dad must be strong. We went over this verse last week. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You might read it another way. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. Oh, he might rebel, and he might get out there, and she might do something not according to the Bible, but if you train them, it's there. My brother Michael, who's in heaven, was a bird dog and beagle guy. I mean, he gave them names. He gave them pedigree. He, he did everything. I saw, I've seen him out there with the bird dog, and he'll take a fishing line, and a reel and he'll throw that thing out there and on the end on the hook is a sock that's been soaked in bird smell and he'll throw that thing out there and he had a bird dog named Lucy a pointer he'd say Lucy whoa 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 Lucy whoa easy now girl easy and that bird that dog would be getting closer Michael would be training her and after a while poof, there goes that point he would love all over her and then he would start over again Come on, Lucy, you can do it. Training, spending time over and over. I've, I've heard my mom say, buddy, call Michael in. It's time for supper. And he's out there training Lucy. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, like I said last Sunday, some people say, Jerry, I've been around a while. I've seen the whole thing. I've heard that preacher say, that Sunday school teacher say, that deacon say, this same verse, and their children are so rebellious, they're out in sin and never came back to God. It doesn't change this verse. You see, what you didn't know was those people didn't live it at home. If you train and come to church and say these things and you don't, you're not consistent at home, they don't stick. There's no way that training is going to stick. The Bible says, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all ye are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. What father is going to discipline a child that's not his? Now, back in the old days, they did. You kids, y'all don't have a clue. Jackson, man, you got it made today. Back in that day, my dad, if somebody down the road got on to me or gave me a little pop on the rear end because I did something at their house, that man would tell my dad and my dad would say, thank you. He probably needed more than that, but thank you. No man spanks somebody who's not their own child. Nobody disciplines somebody that's not their own child. I remember a few years ago, my dad had a deacon. His name was Coin. Coin was really quiet. His family was quiet. I mean, he mostly talked in a whisper. You had to get real close to hear what he was saying. But one thing this whole family did that I never could understand, they grunted all the time. I mean, they'd sit down, uh, they'd stand up, uh. I don't know what the, where this grunt came from, if it was handed down generation to generation. They just grunted. I'd go over to their house, everybody'd sit and grunt, and I'd just grunt with them, uh, you know, grunt. <laughs> Well, when, when Wayne, their son, became a teenager, uh, Dad agreed that it'd be okay for Wayne to come and spend the night with us. We lived in the parsonage right there where now there's a parking lot at Party Hospital in this old two-story house that should not have been called a house. It's about to fall over. Well, our bedroom was upstairs. Actually, actually, our bedroom as teenagers was right over my mom and dad's bed. They could hear every little movement. I mean, the bed wiggle a little bit. Boys, I'm coming up there. Boys, you better behave. 
We knew what that meant because he got so much happiness out of abusing us. He did. He, no, no, I'm seriously. I, I've seen him get happy, more happy after he whipped us than he would on Sunday morning preaching. And he, had, he always kept his belt right there on the hook. So as he went out the door of the bedroom, he already had it doubled up and here he would come. And we knew, we knew we better behave and be in our beds and keep quiet and all that. Well, you understand that three boys, we sang, or slept in the same double bed until my brother went off the war in the Vietnam era. We, that's just, we just shared. So now we got four in a bed. It's getting pretty crowded. And so Wayne had sneaked into our house a deck of cards. You say, what's the big deal? Uh-uh. <laughs> you didn't have a TV. You didn't have a deck of cards. You didn't say anything. It sounded like a bad word. A deck of cards. Pieces of cardboard from Satan in our house. <laughs> And up there in the bedroom we were, and he decided to pull them out. And he started to show us how to play cards. And man, we just felt so dirty and nasty. It was wonderful sin right here in the parsonage. And we're being as quiet. We already told Wayne, don't you, don't make any noise, whatever. Well, my youngest brother Donnie got bored, and he reached up on the wall for our, for our acoustic guitar. And he dropped it. It hit the floor, and it went, wah, 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 wah. I said, get in, boys, hurry. Throw the cars. Donnie, jump in. Leave the guitar. Get under the car. We knew what was happening. Sure enough, you could hear him down there. The cover's thrown back. He's walking. You hear the jingle of the bell. You can hear his big number 10s coming up the steps. I mean, we're in trouble. Hit the lights, boys. Get in the bed. Well, we were smart enough after having survived those things, us three, to get over next to the wall. Wayne didn't know how to defend himself. He's, lay, he's laying under the cover. My dad comes in the blanket of darkness. He's spanking anything that's a hump. And he's getting that thing. I told you, boys, you better not. He didn't even know about the cards. Not that your mother, we got to go to church tomorrow. I've been praying. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Woo! <laughs> the next morning for breakfast, I had to break the news. We're sitting there. I said, Dad, what? Remember last night? He went, yeah. I said, you whipped Wayne. What? Wayne, I forgot you were here. I said, Dad, didn't you hear him when you hit the bed? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They grunt, Dad, they grunt, remember? Ah, uh. Dad, yeah, I, I noticed that noise. I'd never heard that before. And uh, Wayne, so you're here, huh? Yeah, I said, Wayne, do you like ice cream? <laughs> well, now my dad's got to go back to Greer and tell Coyne that he whipped one of his sons. And, and he went back, and, and sure enough, Coyne said the same thing. He probably needed it. You probably should have whipped him longer. <laughs> you know, the Bible says, Jesus, the Bible says a man doesn't chastise somebody unless they're his son. So when you receive discipline from God, that right there certifies you're in the family. If he disciplines you, then you're part of the family. And the dad has this arm. The Bible says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. A father has a muscle. Here's something else. A father has an elbow. A father has an elbow. A dad must be flexible and willing to bend. A dad must demonstrate forgiveness. Yeah, dad, we know who you are. We know what you're made of. We know you can lay down the law. But can you also be flexible? Can you be gentle? Can you tell, show forgiveness? A few times in my, with my three daughters, when I was a dad for them, and they were at the house, I had to go in the bedroom, flip on the light, and say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it in that tone of voice. I did the wrong thing. I had to ask for forgiveness. Oh, no, hey, you know who I am. I'm the man of the house. No, sir. You show them that, they'll never understand God's forgiveness. Whatever you emulate, whatever you act out, has to help them understand God. The Father is the image of God to His children. So how will they ever understand forgiveness unless you yourself are flexible? A father has an elbow. When I taught college English, I had to teach a Greek play called Antigone. Now if you look at the word Antigone, it really looks like Antigone. That's the way it's spelled. He was written by Sophocles, one of the earliest plays. And in this play, there's a dad named Creon. He's married, married, to, Oedipus, uh, married to Oedipus' wife since Oedipus had killed himself in a rage. And Creon has made a rule because his two sons were in a battle against each other. One of them left town and got an army and come back to fight the other. And because both of them killed each other, they're laying there dead, then 
then here Creon makes a decree that he's going to give proper rights to Edicles who stayed home but anybody that touches or tries to commemorate Polynesia's death is going to die. He wants him to lay there and let the dogs and the birds take care of him because he left home and come back. His daughter Antigone has a big heart and she knows what's going on and even though there's a decree through her love she goes out and commemorates the death of Polynesia's and buries him. When he comes back to Creon that somebody has defied his rule, he said, well, here's what's going to happen. I already said it. That person's going to die. And before he finds out that it's his own daughter, Creon's soon-to-be son-in-law, Haman, comes to him and says, Creon, please, let me beg you to be flexible. The person you're fixing to kill, Creon, you're going to regret it. He said, no, I'm not changing my mind. It's a rule, it's a law, and the, the person is going to pay the price. Uh, Haman tries to give him some illustrations. He says, hey, uh, Creon, think of this. Have you ever noticed that when a windstorm comes in, that the trees that are not flexible snap off at the bottom? And those that are just go with the wind, and when the wind's over, they stand straight up. You've got to be flexible. You've got to think of what may happen in the outcome of this story. He still said no. He said, Creon, have you ever thought about this? When a, the winds get into a sail of a boat, if that, if that sail is too tight, that boat goes over. But if that sail is flexible, the wind fills that area and takes the boat on down the sea. He still wouldn't change his mind. And because of that, he had to bring death to his own daughter, Antigone. Think about that, Dad. Sometimes your sternness, your strength is important. Oh, it's really important. But you've got to emulate the forgiveness of God, the gentleness of God. You've got to give them that side, that side of God so they understand that God will forgive them of their sins. Forgiveness. I was studying Antigone one night at the house. Norma came by. She looked over at my shoulder, not knowing how to say that word. And she said, what is an antigone by Sophocles? Antigone by Sophocles. I said, that's Antigone by Sophocles. But then she went to tuxedo school. Anyhow, <laughs> a father has a muscle. His arm has a muscle. A father's arm has an elbow. A father's arm has a hand. A dad must be tender and touch and gently get involved in his father's and his child's life. You have to show how God is important in their daily life. That he doesn't just sit up in heaven and disregard their problems and their cares. But he's actually right there in the middle to use his graces and his mercy to act out the remedies to their situation. That he's one that will reach over and hug you and kiss you even when you're having a bad day. The Father teaches that in his reactions. Take an interest in what your children like. Reinforce your approval of that. In their ups and downs, be tender. It may not come naturally. It don't, not for a big old dad. You know, it don't come naturally. Put the remote control down. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I didn't hear much right there on that. <laughs> I thought I'd be more women saying that. Put the remote control down. Bunch of TV addicts. Okay. Go barefooted. Take your shoes off. Show your ugly feet. Get outside and throw the baseball and the basketball. Kick the soccer ball. Take them fishing. Build something together. You know what they really want? Time. They want your time. The most precious come But Jerry, I worked 47 hours last week. I could hardly get back to the house. You big old strong boy, you. But it's time for you to take them work clothes off and put on father clothes and fake it. Yes, fake it if you have to. Go out and just, <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever, and then go back inside and then watch TV. But you've got to get involved in those children's lives. Why? If you don't, the world will. 
If you don't, that vacancy, that vacant part that should be filled by you is going to be filled by the world and all of its enticements. There's some drug addict out there that's waiting for your child who should be under your time. They're waiting for that opportunity. But if you're filling that, filling that void with your time, if you're tender, then they're going to remember God is tender. Paul said, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Hug your kids. Kiss your kids. Yes, kiss that boy, Dad. Kiss him good. You say, oh, he hates that. He said it's the worst thing ever. He's not going to tell you that he likes it. He's not going to tell you that. But you put a smoocher right on the side of his face, especially when his friends are around. Oh, yeah, that's the best time of father's influence. Here's something else, and we're going fast here. A father's insurance. Not only his influence, but his insurance. Look at that same verse now. Behold the days that will come that I will cut off the, uh, thine arm. Here's the next thing. And the arm of thy father's house. I will cut off the arm of thy father's house. What does that tell him, fathers? Dad should promote God the Father to his children. Keep the doors of spiritual opportunity open to your children. Our job is to ensure with all purpose to keep God's house important to the family. It's dad's job to emphasize God's house. Oftentimes you have a mom come in. She's got her little kids. You look over there and you want to say, where's dad? What's he doing today? The mom has to take the job of the dad. He, she has to get them, all the kids together, get them to church. The dad, one of his most important obligations is to be the one that drives his children toward the house of God. I remember one time in Pelham Baptist Church, this old hard boy lived across the river from the church. They couldn't get him to church. Oh, he was too big for church. He was too strong for church. He didn't need all of that. But every Sunday, here come his wife with their two boys and little small girl. And finally, the little girl got saved. And she got in the altar a couple of weeks. And they said, what are you praying for? I'm praying for him right over there to get in church. Here, the little girl was having to drive the dad back in the church. But it wasn't long. Until the whole family came in, he hit the altar and said, God, forgive me for not being the man of the house to make sure that my family is where they ought to be. How do we do that? How do we, how do we become the, the insurance to make sure our kids and wife get in church? Here's the first thing. Dad should make the Bible a priority. This right here should become a priority. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word of God. A friend of our family's, a friend of my dad's, tells the story. He said his dad had a fifth grade education. And he would come into the house and his dad would be reading the Bible. And he would read it like this. For God so loved, for God so loved, and he went slow and agonized trying to get through that with that fifth grade education. He said, now as a teenager, that became embarrassing to me to bring my big old football friends in the house and hear this coming from the other room. For God so loved a fifth grade education trying to get through that famous verse. He said, I was angry by it. I wouldn't take my friends to the house. He said, it drove me into rebellion and I got into sin. He said, I got to drinking with my friends. Instead of going to church, we'd drink all night on Saturday night. He said, but one night on Saturday night, we were sitting in a bar, and I knew at exactly 10 o'clock, like my dad always did, he'd be reading that verse at the house. He said, I started to put that alcohol to my lips, and the clock behind the bar started chiming 10 times. 
He said, I put it down. And I said, I'm going back to my dad, my father's God. I'm going back to the one that loves me. I'm not going to be ashamed anymore. And he went back and walked in the room and said, Dad, I've come back to take your God. I'm not ashamed anymore. I want you to keep reading. I want to hear you read that verse. For God so loved. A father has to be that demonstration to his children. Dad, read this book out loud. Read it. Get your family together. Sit down and just take a passage and read it so they can see you read it. Hold it up high. Carry it to church. Oh, I know. I have hear it already. But preacher, are you behind times? You know the Bible is on here, don't you? Yeah, you know what you can do with this thing? You can hide it in your pocket. It also has Facebook, Instagram, has all those other things you can do while church is going on. There's one thing about a visible representation of God's Word. It's saying, I'm proud of it. If I have to, I'll die for it. I'm going to carry it. So you're saying I should go get me a big old Bible? I would say a red one. They show up better. Or better than that, pick up that big old family Bible off the coffee table and say, come on, kids, we're going to church. You say, I would never do that. I would never do that. Neither will the world. They don't care about the Bible either. Demonstrate it. Illustrate it. Why? Because the dad has to make the Bible a priority. The dad has to make prayer a priority. I won't bore you with what I said last week about our prayer life and our family. We had devotions every night. You know where I got that from? That 91-year-old man, really old man right there. Because we had to do it every night. They had six children. My dad would say, okay, it's time for devotions. In the living room we'd go. And we'd, he'd read a passage and then we'd start with Michael. He'd pray. I would pray. Donnie would pray. Karen would pray. Miriam would pray. Susan was usually asleep. She was a little bitty thing. But eventually she prayed. And so we all said our prayer. I, I would say words I didn't even know what they meant. I would pray for the missionaries on the foreign field. I seriously thought there was somebody in our field. I did. It didn't matter what I... The fact is, I was praying. And it wasn't because of me. It's because of my father. He made prayer a priority. I remember when he taught Susan to pray, the little one. It was time for her to pray. It was on Sunday right after church. We were sitting, you know how you could tell it was Sunday and right after church? Because in the middle of the table was eight pieces of chicken, two breasts and six legs. You didn't touch them breasts. I tried a couple times. I tried, son, those are for mommy and the wife. You have to have the leg, you know. I, I, I thought, he's going to discipline me next week and I'll have to have a wing. I just know it's going to happen. <laughs> but we were sitting there and everybody took a turn whenever Dad would say, Jerry, pray for the meal today. Michael, pray for the meal. Well, here sat Susan. She was in the high chair. She had just learned to talk a little bit. He said, Susan, pray for the meal. I punched Michael and I said, this is going to get fun. This is going to be good. Get ready for this showdown. Because so Susan had an attitude already. Did I say Misty? I didn't know. Susan. And so Susan's sitting there. Susan bowed her head and didn't do a thing. He said, Susan, I said, pray. He reached over and he went, Susan, pray. Well, about three of those. On the third one, Susan's lips started quivering and she went, I don't want to pray. Amen. Man, man, that, that messed the whole thing up. Daddy lost it. Mother lost it. We all laughed about it. And she won. Yeah, she won. She beat you. All right, last of all, let's get into this. A dad must make a church a priority. And then lastly, a father's inheritance. Look at that verse. And I will cut off the arm of thy father's house. And here it is, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Dad, one day you're not going to be around. You're going to be dead and gone. What's going to be your legacy? What's going to be your legacy? Your legacy is in those children you leave behind. There's your legacy. What should you leave them? What should come your way? Dad, leave for your child a love for the first commandment. Leave a love for the first commandment. Here it is, the first commandment. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And Jesus said, which is the first commandment. Hey, what else should you leave them? Leave them a lock on the first day. A lock on the first day. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. 
And as they were afraid, they bowed down their face to the earth. Why seek you the living among the dead? The angel said, he's not here, but is risen. Put that in their heart, a lock about the first day, and then give them a learning about the last day. This know in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, proud, on and on it goes. But then he says in verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Dad, leave that learning of the last days. Let them understand that we're in the last days. Jesus could come at any moment. Okay, it's after 12. I can tell when it's after 12 o'clock. Jesus could come at any moment. Amen. The Bible says to be ready. He could come. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hey, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. We've got to consider the old man in your house. The Bible says, Behold, the days come, I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. I'm going to close with this illustration this morning. This boy, this preacher sat down on a train years ago when train was a, me, a big means of transportation. He sat down next to this boy in his early 20s, it looked like. The boy had tears coming down his face. So the preacher said, Hey, hey, I'm a preacher. Can I help you? What's going on here? He wiped back the tears and he said, well, let me just tell you what happened. He said, a few months ago, I became rebellious. He said, I went to the point of striking my father. He said, I got out of sin. I felt so bad about it. He said, a couple of weeks ago, I got right with God. I got saved. He said, now I want to go back home. He said, our house, my mom and dad's house is right along the track the railroad track you it's before you get off the depot he said the preacher said well how do you know you're going to be welcome back after all the things you did he said well i wrote my mom and dad a letter and i said hey if i'm going to be welcome back when i pass the house on the train i want you to just put a white rag in the top of that apple tree right next to the house that apple tree when i see that white rag i know that you're welcoming me back home he said preacher we live right around a couple more curves, and I'm too nervous. Would you look for me and tell me what you see? Preacher looked at the yard. He said, son, you don't have any fear. That whole apple tree is full of white rags. Why, well, somebody's going out there and tied a white rag on every limb. And not only that, I don't know who that old gray-haired woman and white-haired man, but they both got a bed sheet, a white bed sheet, and they're waving it in the wind. Son, you're welcomed home. Let me tell you something. You wander out into sin. You think, you got, would God have me back? Would God forgive me? Listen, His grace is plenteous. His mercy is more than you'll ever need. And His forgiveness is eternal. He'll take you back just like a father will forgive. Well, have you made your preparation for the banquet He's prepared? Friend, you got your invitation. Promise me that you'll be there. Can't you hear the master say, Friend, it's time to celebrate. Meet me at the table just inside the gate. Meet me at the table at the breaking of the bread. Meet me over yonder. Join the celebration, heaven's wedding bells will ring. Meet me at the table of the key. Now there's a way that you can make it. Oh, Satan said, don't try. Make that promise and don't break it. And you'll meet me by and by. All trimmed and burning with no shadow of a doubt. Oh, the bridegroom is returning. Don't you live?